Greetings, my young and eager Padawans. It is good to see you all again. I hope your training has been progressing well. I know that the classroom is the least favorite part for most of you, but it is important. One day, you will come to appreciate this fact. Today, we are returning to the history of our galaxy as we know it. Last time, we spoke at length about the Rebel Alliance. We covered their long war against the Empire and finally ended when we discussed the death of Emperor Palpatine, more properly known as Darth Sidious on the second Death Star above the forest moon of Endor. The Emperor's death immediately sent Imperial forces into chaos. Sidious had used the technique of battle meditation to enhance his troops' coordination and morale through the Force, and this backlashed upon his death, sending the Imperial troops into a howling maelstrom of confusion and panic. All cohesion among their fleet completely failed, and they suffered heavy losses at the hands of the rebels. Finally, Captain Gilad Pelion of the ISD Chimera ordered a general retreat. He had become de facto commander of Vader's death squadron with the death of Admiral Strage during the battle, and he knew that the situation above the forest moon was no longer tenable. The Imperials retreated to Anaj, and there held a war council where the situation was discussed. The Empire had suffered very heavy losses, but their fleets remained stocked with plenty of Star Destroyers packing more than enough firepower to continue the war. Captain Pelion recognized that the Rebellion had suffered just as many losses as the Empire, but had far less resources to call upon. He argued that an immediate counterattack with the forces they had available could destroy the Rebellion for good before news of the Emperor's death could spread across the galaxy. However, infighting among the assembled admirals and moths prevented this from happening. Palpatine had never prepared a clear line of succession for the event of his death. Darth Sidious, in his arrogance, had planned to never die, hoping to rule over the Empire forever as a god. The Imperial commanders who survived, or were not present at Endor, bickered amongst themselves, and many removed their forces back to the Deep Core until a clear line of command could be established. While no one person was able to command the entirety of the Empire, some were in greater positions of power. Sate Pestaj was the Emperor's right-hand man, and he assumed control over much of the core. What parts of the Imperial military remained loyal to Coruscant he ordered into defensive positions around the center of the galaxy, essentially ceding control of the outer and mid-rims to the Rebellion, and to a rising number of Imperial warlords. These warlords included Admirals Harsk, Drommel, Zinj, and Teradoc, as well as several of the Moths. Some of these warlords even openly declared their independence, while others fortified their borders while still declaring nominal loyalty to the Empire. The Rebel Alliance, meanwhile, was reorganizing. They had taken severe losses over Endor, and were unable to continue their attack against the Empire while they licked their wounds. They renamed themselves into the Alliance of Free Planets, but Mon Mothma was moving behind the scenes to develop this paradigm into something more. She sent envoys across the galaxy and used diplomacy to begin convincing planets to abandon the Empire in favor of a new republic. Some planets gladly joined this fledgling union, while others wished to be independent. Mon Mothma respected the wishes of this later group, declaring that the new republic was not the Empire, and membership was fully voluntary. Mon Mothma took things a step further by issuing something called the Defense Declarations, dissolving the near-absolute control the planetary security forces had garnered under Palpatine. This returned control of local defense to sovereign planets, their rightful leaders. All member planets of the New Republic had to contribute some of their forces to a federal New Republic military, but they also retained full control over the rest of their local militaries. The declarations were the deciding factor for many worlds when it came time to choose to join the New Republic, and the Empire began to slowly melt away as more and more worlds 
approached Mon Mothma with requests for membership. At the same time, other threats were rising in the galaxy. The Sea Rook, a species of reptilians from the unknown regions, launched an attack on the far-flung world of Bakura. The Sea Rook had a unique form of technology that they called Intechment, which was able to pull the vital energetic essence from living things and use it to fuel machinery. This perversion of the Force was quite powerful, and the Sea Rook were able to use it to create vast fleets of war droids bent on conquest. They were kept at bay by the Empire only by Palpatine's orchestration of a diplomatic exchange with their Imperium. The Empire gained access to the Sea Rook's Intechment, and in return, the Sea Rook received shipments of slaves that they could farm to garner more energy. News of the Emperor's death caused the Sea Rook to view their deal as negated, and they attacked Bakura in full force with the aim of spreading their conquest across the stars. They were stopped only by the swift intervention of the fledgling New Republic, who sent the legendary Luke Skywalker to assess the situation. Master Skywalker was able to intervene, calling in reinforcements from the New Republic in order to aid in the planet's defense. Both New Republic and Imperial forces were involved in the battle, fighting side by side against the invaders from the unknown regions. The Battle of Bakura is a watershed moment for this reason. It marks the first time that Imperials and so-called Rebels cooperated with one another against a common foe. Another emergency broke out shortly after the truce at Bakura. A group of aliens known as the Nagai invaded our galaxy from the satellite dwarf galaxy that is a companion to our own, the cluster of stars known as Fire Fist. The fledgling New Republic was forced to respond, and in the process discovered that the Nagai were refugees fleeing the conquest of their homeworld by another species known as the Toph. The New Republic allied with the Nagai to defeat the Toph incursion, and then the Nagai returned to Fire Fist in an attempt to retake their home. All of this activity left the forces of the New Republic depleted, which slowed inroads into the core. Mon Mothma's diplomatic strategies were the main tool in the New Republic's arsenal during this time, and it was through these techniques that they managed to gain the most ground. The New Republic military was busy putting out brush fires, licking its wounds, and reorganizing itself into a proper galactic federal force. But the act of defeating both the Sea Rook and the Toph helped to convince the galaxy that the New Republic could indeed project galactic security. Meanwhile, the Empire was busy fragmenting into half a dozen petty polities. Worlds had begun flocking to the New Republic, swelling their manpower while dwindling away Imperial resources. Imperial desertion and dissension was actively encouraged by New Republic intelligence and special forces assets in a suite of intelligence operations dubbed Shadow Ops. The Shadow Operators would eventually develop into the secretive New Republic unit known as Alpha Blue, but we will discuss them in another class. For now, simply know that the six major power players who rose to prominence during this period were Grand Moff Artist Kane, Grand Moff Zinge, Truton Teradoc, Sander Delvardis, Moff Prentioc, and Par Lankin. Each of these men found themselves positioned with enough resources and territory to essentially govern their own state. They quickly fell into infighting and squabbling between one another over the right to assume control over the entire empire. Artis Kane pulled his forces back to Oversector Outer in the New Territories, and his borders rubbed up against those of Zinj in the Quelly Oversector. The two battled for control of the Hydean Way. Admiral Teradoc seized power in the Greater Maldrud, an industrial area along the Perlimenian trade route, by placing Grand Moff Selet under house arrest. Admiral Delvardis fortified Ariadu, where he lay claim to the lower portion of the Hydean Way and large chunks of the Rima trade route. Moff Prentioc controlled the Sumbur sector and used his grasp over a powerful chunk of the Imperial Navy 
to patrol the Karelian trade spine. Moff Lankin controlled the Lambda Sector, and he little involved himself in the bickerings of the others, save when it was most strategically viable. There were undoubtedly dozens of other smaller, less influential Imperial warlords scattered across the galaxy, but the mark of these six are the ones that truly impressed itself upon history. The leaders of the nascent New Republic finally met on Mon Calamari in order to discuss how to best make inroads to the heavily fortified core towards the beginning of 4 ABY. The core was still under the control of Sate Pestaj, and the New Republic decided that a policy of slow encroachment would be the best option. Admiral Akbar was tasked with clearing out some of the smaller, less significant Imperial warlords, and he used this time to put the New Republic military through a major reformation. He reorganized them around four fleets, each one tasked with its own area of operations. First Fleet was stationed in the western reaches and tasked with pushing back the Imperials along that front. Second Fleet was tasked with protecting the fledgling Republic's interim capital at Mon Calamari. Third Fleet was stationed on Bathawui and tasked with defense of the Slice, an important area of the galaxy bounded by the Perlimanian trade route and the Karelian run. Fourth Fleet was also stationed on Bathawui as a quick reaction force, tasked with reinforcing either First or Third Fleets if they came under assault. The reforms were finished by the end of 4 ABY, and the New Republic stood prepared to take their war machine on a campaign of liberation. First Fleet drove towards Ariadu under Admiral Firmus Nance. Nance was a strategic mastermind, and he was able to roll Del Vardis' forces while simultaneously combating a rising pirate element that sought to take advantage of the chaos. Nance methodically pushed the First Fleet through the Hevral Sector, winning major engagements at Morja, Banastar Station, and Glomfo. Nance was able to hem in three of the major Imperial warlords, Delvardis, Prentiak, and Lankin, seriously negating their impact on any major thrusts forward. Third Fleet was led personally by Admiral Akbar, and he moved them towards Kashyyyk, where he engaged the forces of Moff Dark and Grand Admiral Sin. Akbar was able to catch the Grand Admiral Star Destroyer out of position, and Sin was killed when his bridge was vaporized. Kashik sat at a nexus of six major hyperlanes, and the victory there gave Third Fleet the ability to strike across the mid-rim and into the core. Admiral Akbar followed up this victory with a daring raid on the core world of Brental, led by the famous Rogue Squadron. Rogue Squadron was able to defeat Imperial Admiral Lon Asodo over Brental, and they captured one of the Empire's best pilots, the infamous Sun Tier Fell, leader of the 181st Imperial Fighter Wing. Fourth Fleet, while this was happening elsewhere, pushed out from Bothawui under command of the Duros Admiral Voon Masa. They were tasked with capturing the vital industrial world of Druckenwell, and when they did, it gave the New Republic access to the Karelian run. This allowed First and Fourth Fleets to link up and allowed the New Republic to mass their forces. The fledgling galactic government was slowly hemming the Empire into the core. Things did not fully proceed as planned, however. Admiral Lon Bangir, an underling of Admiral Zinj, discovered a secret Mon Calamari hyper route to the world of Hast, where the New Republic had a hidden repair and refit yard. He raided the yard with a disguised fleet of TIE fighters and TIE bombers, destroying more than 30 New Republic capital ships in the process. This forced Second Fleet into the defensive around Mon Calamari and kept them from going on the offensive against Zinj and Teradoc. This meant that the Greater Maldrud and the upper tract of the Hydean Way remained firmly in Imperial control, which, in turn, meant that the New Republic would have an enemy on their flank if they attempted any serious drives towards the core. Regardless, Admiral Akbar and the rest of New Republic High Command believed that they could wait no longer. In 5 ABY, the New Republic began the long, 
hard drive towards Coruscant. Fourth Fleet pushed from Druckenwell to Milagro, where they won a hard-fought, bloody victory and drove the Imperials to Spirana. The Imperials soon counterattacked and very nearly caught Mon Mothma while she was inspecting the Fourth Fleet. The Fourth was able to repulse the Empire's assault, and then Admiral Voon continued his drive down the Corellian Run, slowly grinding through Imperial forces. Admiral Nance and the First Fleet had an easier time of it, winning a series of quick battles against Del Vardis that saw the Imperial driven from his region of space. He was forced to retreat into the Deep Core, and Nance drove down the Rim of Trade route after him. Admiral Akbar split command of the Third Fleet between Admirals Burke and Callback with the directive to drive towards the Galactic North in order to cut off Teradoc from the core. Burke took his half of the Third Fleet and pushed towards Tagoria, where he won a decisive victory against Teradoc's forces. Then he moved to Lantilles, where another victory allowed him to establish a beachhead on the Perlimanian trade route. Admiral Burke then pushed towards the core, where he defeated one of Teradoc's underlings, near Kola, thus opening the way for the New Republic to invade the core proper. Burke was then able to link up with the Enclave established by Rogue Squadron at Brentall, establishing a true New Republic cordon around most of the core. Callback had much less success. He attempted to drive up the Hydean Way into the heart of Zinja's territory, but he was repulsed by Zinja's Super Star Destroyer at Corson. Callback was forced to retreat to Abroa Sky, where his element of Third Fleet was rolled into the New Republic Rapid Response Task Force under the command of Luke Skywalker. The Response Task Force was responsible for responding to any emerging situations that required a quick response. It was hoped that the task force could respond to emerging galactic situations without drawing resources away from the other New Republic fleets. The task force was soon drawn into conflict with the Imperial Warlord known as Shadowspawn, a dark side acolyte of Darth Sidious who had risen to prominence on the world of Mindor. He was using the planet as a base to launch strikes against New Republic targets in the Inner and Mid Rim, and the Response Task Force battled against Shadowspawn's forces to the last man across the planet's surface. The world was utterly devastated and the violence of the confrontation convinced Luke Skywalker to resign his commission with the New Republic Navy in order to focus on being a Jedi. By 6 ABY, Admiral Nance had completely defeated Prentiok and pacified the Western Reaches in the name of the New Republic. He began to prepare for a push into the Southern Core. Admiral Massa of the 4th Fleet was killed in battle, but his replacement, Admiral Dorat, was able to break Imperial lines on the Corellian run and advance all the way to the colonies. The core was beginning to become truly surrounded, but there were still two major threats to the New Republic's drive on Coruscant. The first was the Pentastar Alignment, led by Grand Moff Kane. The Alignment still dominated over Sector Outer, but the New Republic was content to leave him there unmolested. Kane, for his part, had shown little interest in involving himself with the brushfire wars that had plagued the galaxy. He instead focused on his own affairs, which left Admiral Zinj as the largest threat to any push the New Republic would make into the core. Admiral Akbar realized that the time had come to deal with Zinj, and he ordered Third Fleet up the Hydean in order to push him further away from the New Republic forces on Coruscant. The fighting progressed well at first, but Zinj was able to defeat New Republic forces at Paqualis. Akbar knew that he could advance no further up the Hydean at that time, and so he ordered much of Third Fleet into a strong defensive line across New Republic territory on the Hydean. Then he ordered Admirals Burke, Dorat, and Nance into the core. The New Republic invasion of the last strongest remaining bastion of Imperial power had begun. The New Republic saw victories at Bilbringi and Palani, giving them a clear shot down the Namadi Corridor to Coruscant. Meanwhile, on the Galactic Capital, Imperial politics continued to plague what remained of the Empire. 
After Palpatine's death over Endor years earlier, there had been an uprising on Coruscant, one which Izani Isard had reacted swiftly and violently to put down. Asani Rizard was the head of Imperial Intelligence, and the slow reaction of other Imperial leaders to this uprising led Isard to believe that none of them were fit to truly rule the Empire. She organized political and military scandals which saw Sate Pestaj ousted from power, and she was firmly in control of the Empire by 5 ABY. Izard was a strategic and tactical genius, and she understood the situation as the New Republic began to make gains around the core. She began to enact a plan which she hoped would bring the New Republic to its knees. She openly retreated from Coruscant in 7 ABY, and the New Republic simply could not resist the watershed moment of taking the capital world. They sent forces to the planet, but their troops became bogged down by Imperial units which had been left behind and given directives to fight to the very last man. Additionally, Izard released a bioweapon known as the Krytos virus on Coruscant. The Krytos virus was designed to target alien species, and it began to burn its way through Coruscant's population. Millions died in agonizing death, and the only cure was exposure to large amounts of Bacta. I'm sure none of you need a reminder, but for the sake of being thorough, Bacta is a miracle substance that at the time was carefully regulated to limit the number of producers to only two. Izard had managed to use her connections to assume control of Thyfera, one of the main planets where Bacta was produced en masse, and she denied supply to the New Republic. She planned to let the Krytos virus rampage unchecked, eating at the Republic from within at a time when it was already beginning to become stretched thin. The New Republic, now a governing body bound by duty and the rule of law to its member worlds, could not interfere since Isard had managed to take control of Thyfera through legal means. She was the legitimate ruler of the planet and owner of the Bacta there, and there was nothing that could be done to stop it. The legendary Rogue Squadron, who were vital in the taking of Coruscant in the wake of Isard's retreat, resigned their posts in the New Republic in order to pursue Isard to Thyfera. There, they waged a private war against the head of Imperial Intelligence, and they were eventually able to overthrow Isard. She was thought dead by the wider galaxy in the wake of her defeat, and the flow of Bacta was restored to the New Republic. The Krytos virus was stopped in its tracks. It took the fledgling galactic government months to completely clear the galaxy's traditional capital on Coruscant. New Republic fleets had trouble policing the vast area of the core and continuing their push across other areas of the galaxy. But with Coruscant taken, the drive against Zinj's empire on the Hydean Way continued. Admiral Akbar and elements of 3rd and 4th fleets battled against Zinj's forces in a wide-ranging conflict that left many worlds devastated. Zinj was finally defeated over the world of Dathomir in 7 ABY by Han Solo and a fleet of Haven battle dragons who were convinced to the cause by Princess Leia's relationship with Prince Isolder of the Enigmatic Hapes Cluster. Zinj's flagship, the Iron Fist, was destroyed and he was killed in its death throes. His territory fragmented into smaller polities in the wake of his demise and these small holdouts were pacified by New Republic elements over the final months of 7 ABY and the start of 8 ABY. With Zinj at last defeated, the New Republic was able to shift their focus from pacifying the Hydean Way to overcoming the last few Imperial Fortress worlds in the core. The most important of these worlds was Kuat, one of the most heavily defended systems in the galaxy and one of the largest ship producers. Kuat Drive Yards was one of the largest ship producers for the Empire, and a threefold plan was constructed in order to finally crack Kuat open. First, Rall Rai Muvunk, the Twi'lek Minister of Commerce for the New Republic, had a small shell company begin buying up stock in Kuat Drive Yards. The Empire had nationalized the company years ago, as we discussed before in this class, and this caused the stock price to plummet, allowing Muvunk to buy it en masse. While he was working the stock market, Tycho Kelchu, a member of Rogue Squadron, 
prepared a contingent of A-Wings to carry special experimental torpedoes, and Admiral Akbar began to redeploy a large number of Mon Calamari cruisers to the Horthaf system, a very short jump from Kuat itself. General Aaron Kraken orchestrated an espionage operation while Muvunk and Kelchu prepared, where undercover slicers managed to sneak a virus onto several Imperial Star Destroyers that were at Kuwadi Dry Dock. At last, when the virus was set, preparations were complete. The attack began when Tycho Kelchu jumped into the system with his squadron of modified A-Wings. The virus that had been pre-planted activated at the same time, sealing the hangars on the Star Destroyers in Dry Dock and causing their turbo lasers to open fire on one another. Admiral Akbar soon jumped into the system with his force of Mon Calamari cruisers, and at the same time, Muvunk called an emergency meeting of shareholders. Kuwat surrendered quickly when it was revealed that the New Republic owned 37% of Kuwat drive yards. It was a coup of a victory, but it was not without its blemishes. Imperial sleeper agents that had been planted throughout the company received a signal several hours after the system had fallen to the New Republic and they engaged in acts of sabotage that crippled Kuat's ability to produce vessels for several months while undergoing repairs. The defeat of Zinj and the fall of Kuat officially shifted the balance of power in the galaxy fully in favor of the New Republic. They had gone from plucky, upstart rebellion to powerful, organized, egalitarian galactic government in the span of a few short years. Their fleet system proved integral to helping defeat the independent elements of the Empire, and planet after planet began to clamor to join the newly reformed New Republic Senate. 30% of the galaxy was firmly under New Republic control by the dawn of 8 ABY, and another 20% was cautiously optimistic in their support. However, the journey to freedom and peace was far from over. Grand Moff Kane and the Pentastar alignment were still a major power centered on the world of Bastion, with strong fleets and able Imperial officers at the helm. They controlled almost all of Oversector Outer, and they could threaten the New Republic at any time. Additionally, many of the Imperial elements scattered across the galaxy had begun to disappear. Smaller Imperial holdouts melted away entirely, while New Republic forces still engaged in heavy fighting saw less and less Imperial ships facing them down on the other side of the line. New Republic intelligence services, including the enigmatic Alpha Blue, reported that many of these Imperial forces were being drawn away from the conflict with the New Republic and towards the Deep Core, though no one could determine why. But I think that is enough for one lesson. Today, we've discussed some of the ramifications of Emperor Palpatine's demise. We discussed how his officers fell into infighting, and how the Empire fragmented into separate warring states. We talked about how the New Republic fought for many years to drive back the Imperial line in order to lay claim to the galaxy. The work of revolution is never a quick or easy road, and the true effort did not begin until Darth Sidious was defeated. It was a long, hard fight to restore that which had been lost to the tyranny of the Sith, and in many ways, it was a battle that has never ended. We feel the ramifications of these far-off days, even in our own time, echoed in the structure of the Galactic Alliance that the galaxy currently calls its galactic government. Next time, we will be discussing the devastating campaigns of Grand Admiral Thrawn and the Emperor Reborn and how the New Republic withstood these threats to its existence. You have all done me a great service listening for this long, and I want to impress upon each of you how important it is to learn the lessons of history. A true Jedi understands that there is wisdom in the past, and that by applying the lens of hindsight to the actions of our ancestors, we can more readily prepare for the future. All right, my young Padawans, no more yapping on my account. You have lightsaber training next, and Master Ligar is likely already waiting for you. Try not to forget all this the second you leave. Be off with you, and may the Force be with you all. <laughs>